Two of my favorite uh, China hands are with us tonight. And um, I should say at the outset that in the China watching community, we uh, generally don't agree on very much. But one of the very few things we agree on this week is the importance and the quality of this book. Uh, Wealth and Power, China's Long March to the 21st Century is um, an important um, contribution on a subject that I think a lot of us have been paying attention to. And for me, in, in a sense, this book is trying to answer a kind of intellectual mystery, which is, how is it that barely 100 years ago, China was in the last gasps of imperial decline? It was on its way to civil war, revolution, famine, political upheaval. And now today, of course, we look at China and we see a civilization that has allowed more people to climb out of poverty than any civilization in history, 500 million or so at last count. Over the last 30 years, China has grown at about 10% a year, meaning that the economy has doubled in size every seven or eight years. And I think for a lot of us, those of us who pay close attention, the question is, how did this happen? What are the ideas that propelled this country through history and ultimately are pointing it towards the future? If you think that our subject today is just history and that it is about things that happened 100 or 150 years ago, let me just put it very briefly into some contemporary context. I flew from Beijing last month to Washington. And very recently, of course, the Chinese government has had a leadership transition. There's a new generation of leaders uh, in charge of the Communist Party. Last fall, when they took their very first steps out of the Great Hall of the People, their first appearance as a group, the leaders of the new Politburo, this was a symbolically significant moment. They're trying to, uh, they could go to a technology company to show that they're thinking about innovation. They could go to a university to show that they're thinking about investing in higher education. But actually, the setting they chose was a museum. And in fact, it was an exhibit at the museum called The Road to Rejuvenation. And to the Chinese viewers who saw that appearance, the message was very clear. And the new president, Xi Jinping, made it explicit. He said, the Chinese dream is the dream of rejuvenation. And that really is our subject today. What does that mean, rejuvenation in a Chinese context? Why does it matter? And ultimately, where is it leading us? Um, it's a great pleasure to be uh, with John Delory and Orville Schell. I will introduce first John uh, on uh, the far right. John is a historian by training, trained at Yale, and he is an expert on Chinese, he's an intellectual historian, and, and particularly on, on 17th century Confucian thought, which I think probably he never imagined would be quite as much in the headlines as it is <laughs> in China now. Uh, John is also uh, a, a close and very knowledgeable observer of the Korean Peninsula, and he is, uh, uh, teaches history at Yonsei University in Seoul. Orville Schell, I think, is a familiar face to many of you in this room. Orville is the Arthur Ross Director of the Center on U.S.-China Relations at the Asia Society. He's been the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism at Berkeley, and of course he's been going to China since 1975. And I, it, lest you think that it was a luxurious assignment in 1975, I can report to you that one of the first things he did was spend time on the Dajai Model Agricultural Work Brigade. So it was not the Park Hyatt. But I think um, today uh, it's a chance for us to tie some of this recent history and some of this ancient history together. And in fact, I want to start, Orville, um, with you about this book and why, uh, why you chose this book. You've done, over the course of your career, you've written a, a number of books and articles that have shaped the way we see China, particularly contemporary China. Why, in this case, did you decide to reach back 150 years to try to put it into a different perspective, and why now? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, having spent really my whole life uh, working, yeah, uh, trying to sort of see what Chinese history was all about. Um, I was a little bit startled uh, by the last 30 years, last 25 years. Uh, you know, when I first went to China, Mao Zedong was still alive. 
the Cultural Revolution was raging. You know, there was uh, uh, no fashion. There were no advertisements. There was not one single private car, no private businesses. And if you had, if somebody had, if I'd had a visitation from somebody who said, you know, 10 years from now, uh, China's going to be the way it actually is now, I would have thought they were bereft of their senses. So that really, uh, I mean, raises an interesting question. How does a country, in effect, turn into its opposite? How does it invert itself, in a way? Turn around from class struggle, cultural revolution, Marxist revolution, all of these things which seemed so indelible at the time, to do what it's done. And I, I really didn't have an answer to that. And um, uh, this idea of rejuvenation uh, is an interesting one because I think it, it, it hints to us just how important that idea of China being reborn as something of consequence and of, and of greatness actually is. And when uh, Xi Jinping, the new party general secretary and president, went across Tiananmen Square to the new National Museum and visited this show that Evan has just mentioned. Uh, I mean, John and I uh, were communicating, as we have been, and just thought, bingo. You know, this, this is exactly what we've been writing about. This is the newest incarnation of this incredible urge. And they, maybe John will have some more thoughts on that. So Xi Jinping scooped you by a few months. You know, he did, thank God. Uh, he, he really wrote the blurb for our book. Uh, and, and, and you. <laughs> and, and Evan also wrote one, you will see. A very Do nice you think, thing. John, did you set out to write a book about wealth and power or Fuchang, or did you find it along the way? Um, that's a good question. You know, uh, you, since you mentioned some of my 17th century stuff, and this is the only chance to really talk to, about it to a captive audience, um, <laughs> my dissertation research you know, was on an even earlier period. Um, but at, at one point along the process of, of working together with Orville, it, su I suddenly, it dawned on me that the subtitle of my dissertation um, was Power, uh, Money, and Mores, you know, or Values. Uh, in the context of the 17th century thinker. So it was really another form of, of wealth and power, but, but in another context. So it is something, um, something that I had been thinking about. Um, and then it was in collaboration with, with Orville, where the two of us decided to, you know, both of us with strong interest in intellectual history. Uh, I mean, we, we already had a sense that that might be the key theme, but I'm not sure we had completely decided on it. We, we wanted to let the texts, you know, decide for us. So we started reading intensively in, in some of the people we thought were the most interesting Chinese thinkers and, and as well as the key political figures of the 19th and 20th century. And lo and behold, I mean, every seminal reformist text, wherever it was on the political spectrum of that moment, you know, uh, from more liberal progressive reformers uh, to almost fascist uh, figures to communists and various Marxists, they all hit on this wealth and power of Fuchang uh, in Chinese. So, so, uh, so it, was, it was a combination, but over the course of working on the book, it was very clear to us you know, that we had, we had found that, that central theme that could link these things together. So for those people who are getting ready to read the book, we've got 11 profiles of people from across the spectrum. You've got public intellectuals, you've got government officials, uh, you've got people as diverse as the last dowager, uh, Empress Dowager, all the way up to Liu Xiaobo, who is the Nobel Peace Laureate who's in prison. What does it mean when you say wealth and power? Let's define the terms for people. What does that actually mean? What is it that they're going for? Is it about individual wealth? Is it about national wealth? Um, what is it that ties all of these, all of these very disparate thinkers together? Uh, well... You know, the, the wealth and power complex, and I think we could call it a complex for China, um, has sort of two sides to it. And one is the fact that this is actually a very old term, even pre-17th century. It's a, it's a 2,500-year-old concept. So it's deeply rooted uh, in Chinese thinking. Uh, most of us are more familiar with Confucianism as sort of the representative strand of traditional Chinese thinking. But this notion of wealth and power comes from uh, alternate tradition. Actually, tradition was quite critical of Confu Confucianism called legalism. Uh, 
Uh, and so these legalist thinkers have been arguing throughout the, the imperial era that the goal of political leaders um, and of their advisors, so the intellectuals as it were, should be figuring out how to make the, the kingdom strong and the people wealthy, or the military strong and the kingdom uh, wealthy. And so that is something that runs throughout uh, the course of 2,000 years in China. But what's remarkable is the way that that very old idea resurfaces in the 19th century. And, and maybe Orville wants to elaborate on this because it resurfaces in the context of China uh, quite abruptly falling from being really the dominant power, certainly in East Asia, really in Asia, which to China was the world. You know, if you stop the clock where we sort of begin the book in the 1790s, China is the center of the world as it knows it, and suddenly drops from that position. And that's when this wealth and power complex resurfaces because it's the driving force. It is wealth and power for China in a modern context that will restore it to that position of dominance that, uh, that it had had before. Yeah, I, I, you know, when we talk about the origins of China today, the China that we that we know, there's a lot of ways you could, a lot of moments you could identify as the origins. People might say 1978 when Deng Xiaoping and his colleagues launched the country on economic reforms. Of course, there's 1949, the founding of the People's Republic. You have identified a different point. Where is that point, and why did you choose that as the beginning of your story? Well, I think the where, where we and most Chinese would view uh, modern Chinese history as beginning is with the Opium War, 18, late 1830s, and then finally this humiliating treaty that they signed, the Treaty of Nanjing, uh, which is the beginning of the so-called uh, unequal treaties. And this was, uh, you know, as we've sort of in a cursory fashion described, the beginning of a tremendously agonizing fall from grace where Britain arrives, this tiny little island, you know, and they've got some really killer ships and they just totally rout the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And the Qing dynasty has no choice in hopes of making these barbarians, as they're called, go home again just to sign this treaty uh, and try to get rid of these people. Well, of course, they don't go. There's another opium war, then one after another, the great powers, finally ending with Jap Japanese occupation, sort of bite away at China and turn it into this sort of vassal state. So I think, you know, this is the sort of seminal experience out of which the whole ideology of not only the Communist Party, but Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalist Party was woven of China being preyed upon, China being uh, uh, occupied, colonialized, and victimized. The curious thing is, and uh, that get John to say a few words about this, that this victimization complex, you might think, would be rather embarrassing and paralyzing because victims are usually people who are acted upon. But in reality, uh, by a strange twist of sort of philosophical fate, this victim complex did serve as a goad for some of this extraordinary energy, which I'm sure all of you have seen if you've been to China. You know, this, this kind of get it done mentality that has led to the so-called China boom. John, you, 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 this is really your field of how this got this victimization thing in the Confucian world got transmogrified into energy. I do. I, you start the book by saying you tell the story of a scholar named Wei Yuan, who, if I have it right, said in 1842, when the country is humiliated, its spirit will be aroused. Is this unique to Chinese thinking, to Chinese philosophy? Is there elements of this that there's a logical connection to the past, or was this the first time that it was articulated as a matter of humiliation? Uh, well, again, you know, with, with so many things like that quotation in China, what seems to be 19th century turns out to be that one is, I guess.
American popular culture, you know, if in this bookstore we went to the self-help section and looked into victimization, I think we have different notions, different connotations of, of victimization than what it means in a Chinese context. I think when we look from the West at nationalism in China and the humiliation narrative, one of the questions, one of the assumptions is often that this is an idea that is sort of... Um, instilled from above in the education system that it's projected very clearly through state media and there is no question the presence of that it's true but i'm trying to understand how much of this is already exists in people's collective memory sort of cultural memory and how much of it is being actively promoted now by the state and i'll, I'll give you one example there's a whenever we see protests in beijing one of the one of the details is that there are buses often that bring students from university campuses. And for a long time, this was the kind of detail you see in news stories that say this is a demonstration of the role of the state. And then a university professor recently explained to me, teaches at Tsinghua, he said, actually, no, no, they've got it backwards. One of the reasons to have the buses is so that people don't walk from the campuses and get distracted along the way and start protesting about other things. <laughs> And that made sense to me. Well, you know, I think it's undeniable that the Chinese Communist Party is a, they do a lot of manipulation and they turn nationalism on and off in ways that suit their purpose. But if we only viewed that whole phenomena as a manipulation, I think we'd be making a deep mistake. This idea of China as a victim, you know, it isn't just something that the communists uh, confected. It goes way back. And there was no one who I think wrote more passionately, in a way surprising to say, than Chiang Kai-shek about China's sorry state. And in fact, wa he wanted to get rid of the uh, unequal treaties, but finally didn't succeed until the 1940s. So he had this very profound sense of having been wronged, of his country having been grievously hurt. But you know what's interesting about uh, a victim culture is that, you know, it, 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 it is, if you build a culture out of humiliation, it's humiliating. And at the same time that China is sort of trying to energize its people with this notion, of course, it's also fiercely proud. And so there's a high wire act that's going on this whole time between this, trying to, this effort to try to keep the dignity of China as a great nation, even when it's, when it's not. And you see this in a lot of revolutionary bravado during the Mao era. You know, you want to be of consequence even if you have to be a bad actor. You want people to pay attention. You, what you don't want them to do is to certainly prey upon you and bully you, but you also don't want them to ignore you. You know, I think that the, the temptation is to look at the kind of humiliation narrative we're talking about and put it into a contemporary diplomatic context and say, well, this is going to inspire China to be more assertive, be more confrontational on the world stage. Is that right? Is that a, the right way to look at it? How do you see this playing out in U.S.-China relations, for instance, Orville? I think it's a little early to call that one. I, I, I do think any power that gains such rapid uh, increase in its its wealth and power, particularly after it's imagined itself as a, as a victim and abused, you know, it, it takes incredible leadership to modulate its response and not want to put the shoe on the other foot. So I think, uh, you know, China's just gotten wealthier and more powerful, this long yearned for state of grace. And now the question is, what next? How is it going to use it? And this is a little bit unclear. China is not the only country in the region that has a wealth and power narrative. This is another interesting dimension of it. I mean, John, you live in Seoul. You pay close attention to what's happening there. How is this being felt around the neighborhood? Well, there's, there's two interesting sides to that, Evan. I mean, one is that and actually, we, we, we don't write, maybe this is the sequel, Orville, the Wealth and Power 2, um, is this concept, you can find sort of the lineage of this idea throughout uh, East Asia or Northeast Asia. I mean, we do talk at length about Japan in the book because Japan was a critically important 
uh, model. First, the Chinese ignored and looked down on Japan. Uh, then they realized the Japanese, the reformers in China realized the Japanese were moving quickly ahead of them. And so Japan became a kind of inspiration. And then, as Orville mentioned, Japan became an occupier. Uh, and an imperialist power. So it's an incredibly complex relationship. But during that whole period in Japan, Japan had imported this notion of Fuchang, of wealth and power. And in fact, the Japanese were reading Wei Yuan, this thinker that Evan mentioned, more carefully than the Chinese. And he was going through multiple editions uh, in Japan in the 1850s and 60s at a time when he wasn't getting that much attention back in China. Uh, and so that notion, it also migrated to Korea. Uh, a, a century later, so in the 1960s and 70s, when South Korea really took off and had its economic miracle, uh, the leader there also spoke about the exact same, you know, they share Chinese characters. So in Korean, they also spoke about wealth and power. And uh, even now, as Evan knows, I'm a, and he sort of shares the bug, as does Orville, we're all interested in North Korea, even North Korea. Uh, tiny struggling North Korea, as scary as it is, they talk about wealth and power, and they use this notion uh, um, with a slight change in the characters, but it's the same concept. So, um, so Japan, the Koreas, China, they all share this, and and that's quite useful for those of us trying to understand the international politics of the region. That in some ways these countries get each other. They get each other's fundamental motivation. But then the trick is, can they all achieve wealth and power without getting in each other's way? And of course, Japan didn't during its rise in the early 20th century, and everyone remembers that. And so that shapes the way in which uh, both Koreas, as well as Japan and other countries all around Asia, the way they're watching China's rise. I mean, they're watching it with much more unease than Americans are because they, I should say, we are much closer to it. You know, we're living right in the shadow of that, that growth. I'm curious, though, about what's happening now in China. One of the things you read about is that we're very clearly at the end of the double-digit growth period. This era in which the Communist Party's legitimacy was tied very closely to year-on-year -year econo economic growth, tangible improvements in people's lives. Not that that's going to come, probably, come to a screeching halt, but the era of having... 10, 15 percent growth a year is over. So what happens to the wealth and power narrative at this point? You know, um, I, I have a distinct sense, and you probably share this, Evan, having just spent, what, almost eight years in China, um, that something is coming to an end, and something has to begin again. We have a, this, this curtain has to come down here, and we have to have another act that's as yet unwritten. But on the other hand, I have to say, I have watched China closely. I've stood in Tiananmen Square in 1989 during the demonstrations, and I thought, lights out, it's over. And it wasn't. You know, Deng Xiaoping managed to reinstate the party, and he managed to recatalyze the economy and send the country off on the tear that we've watched the last 20 years of. So I, I've learned to sort of chasten my normal expectations about dividing lines. Do I think they can tweak this one and go on another 10 years? I, I really doubt it. But did I think they would have 20 odd years, 10% uh, growth? No. Did anybody? I don't know a single solitary person who in 1989 thought what would happen did w what happened would happen. And we have called it wrong, I think, since. So I, I just don't know the answer to that. Yeah, and I mean, we, we talk, you know, we're not economists, but then again, Deng Xiaoping said, I'm a layman when it comes to economics. So that emboldened us to weigh into some of the economic <laughs> issues. Um, and, and we did try in one of the chapters on Zhu Rongji, who was really the economic, you know, czar for the 1990s. And it's interesting in, in looking closely at that with a little bit of historical perspective, the struggle in the 90s for China was to not grow too fast. And you can see in Zhu Rongji, he had to combine two principles of Chinese economic reform and opening up. One is fast growth, which is what Deng Xiaoping championed. But there was another wing 
uh, in the in the leadership that said we have to maintain coordination, you know, and we have to we have to be careful of inflation, we have to be careful of bubbles developing, we have to be careful of inequality and these sorts of things. So, you know, I think the economic argument can be made, and some economists make it that just focusing on single digit versus double digit and purely on GDP, you know, rate of increase of a, a kind of pure quantitative um, metric is not the right one. So. That does, I mean, that just puts the burden even more on the question of what will China do in terms of structural economic reform. You know, so many people who watch this even more closely than, than we do are looking at the upcoming uh, October meeting, you know, to see what kind of economic reforms are announced. But there are signals, you know, and the new premier, Li Keqiang, um, is talking a pretty serious game in terms of addressing some of these structural issues. So, you know, a slowdown could still enable uh, China, to, China to wrestle with that. And as Orville suggesting, um, you know, open yet a new, a new act. Uh, not just China, we should say the party. What we're really talking about is, is the resilience of the Communist Party, which is not communist at all anymore, um, but remarkably has retained its hold on power. The Wealth and Power Party. We yeah. Might the,